Next up, we have Emerging Markets Cannabis Investing and Beyond, moderated by Christopher Foltz. Christopher Foltz is Vice President of Global Reach for Sensi Media Group. From Christopher's roots in national politics, to a battle with drug addiction, to 119 days in county jail, and losing everything to the point of homelessness, Christopher has reestablished himself as one of the most engaging initiators of social impact and development in the nation. I'm really looking forward to this panel. Same, same. As your moderator, take it away, Chris. Hey everyone, this is Chris Foltz, the Vice President of Global Reach with Sensi Magazine and Sensi Media Group. I'm back today with what I consider to be just a, a very interesting and dynamic panel. You know, I've spent a lot of time in the cannabis world and prior to that I come from the world of politics and one thing that's always been this elusive creature to me is the world of investments. And, and mainly in cannabis, there, there's investments are, are the starting point for many brands, but oftentimes the ending points for many brands as well. Uh, so I gathered some of my friends today that really know this industry better than most. And uh, I wanted to get them together for a conversation for all of you. And let me remind everyone that for those of you that are watching, this is live. Um, so there is a question chat bot, uh, box, I believe, right below where you're watching. Feel free to add your uh, questions inside there. I know a lot of people have already been messaging, say, hey, listen, how do I get in front of these panelists with my ideas and concepts? Well, it all starts with the communication. And these are some of the best people that you could possibly imagine in the industry. Uh, today, I'm joined with a friend of mine, Tay Darnell, who's the co-founder of Sensi Magazine and Sensi Media Group. Not only is he an accomplished attorney who's done a tremendous amount uh, in the industry, uh, but he's a colleague of mine that has really taught me a tremendous amount about this industry as well. Uh, also, I'm joined uh, by Gene, Gene and Arcview. For those of you that have not met, I asked Jean at one point, what is CIO? I know it's a chief investment officer. And she's like, well, you know, I, I read somewhere it's chief inspiration officer, all these. She's like, you know, I'm all of the eyes above, but she's probably one of the best team players when it comes down to the cannabis industry. There's so many things things when we're having a conversation with Jean, she said, hey, listen, uh, you know, I'm working with this person on this, the other person on the panel, even right before this, she says, I'm involved with Matt on several projects. So that I uh, definitely stands for team, just spelled a different way, Jean. So I really appreciate you being here, Jean Sullivan and Matt, Matt Hawkins. For those of you that don't know Entourage Effect Capital, a lot of people don't know some of the biggest players' names that are behind the scenes in the capital game inside the cannabis world. And Matt represents probably one of the most diverse portfolios I've seen. And I said this to Matt, I said, Matt, listen, I love your diverse portfolio. He says, hey, we're not there yet. We're still growing. We have a lot of growth to do. And when I hear that from somebody with such an accomplished record as Matt, that means that they're, their fingers on the pulse. They're constantly looking for the new trends in the industry. And they're, they're not afraid to make pivots towards things that matter. So Matt Hawkins from Entourage Effect Capital, uh, before, formerly known as Crespo, was it, what was it, Matt? Crespo, Crespo Group Capital prior? Cresco Capital Partners. Cresco Capital Partners. I apologize. I forget the old because I'm focused on the new, Matt. So I really appreciate right. you being here as well. Uh, Tay, why don't you do me a favor? Explain a little bit about your background in this industry. I know you're an attorney. I know you co-founded our magazine and media group, but you're sitting here on an investment and finance panel. Why is that? I think it was uh, being a subject of torture for a long period of time. Um, Kidding aside, I was I, I came into the industry uh, as an attorney. I was one of the first three cannabis attorneys in the state of Colorado back in 2008 is when I started. And it was really by default. Um, my background prior to that was in the entertainment and music industry. Um, I was also the general counsel for the biggest NFL agency in the country at the time. But a, a good friend of mine had just won a lawsuit in the state of Colorado in 2007 that effectively created the dispensary model. Um, he was so overwhelmed with calls and and trying to get people uh, locations and opening dispensaries that he asked if I could take calls in Denver and help him out some. Um, and I just loved it. You know, from a civil rights perspective, I came from a household with 20 plus people in it. Uh, 10 boys in my bedroom, half of which were Native American and the rest black and a couple white guys. So I got to see the impact of the war of drug of the war on drugs growing up. Um, you know, I've, I've seen its devastating effects. So I somehow got this weapon as an attorney to make an impact. Um, I ended up helping write the Colorado model, HB 1284 and SB 109, which has been used as the guidance at this point nationally and internationally for the legalization of cannabis everywhere. Um, helped with legalization. But in 2014, um, I was approached by a gentleman that was a co-founder of a company called Zanga, which was fresh off their, I think, $9 billion IPO that wanted to get into the cannabis space. So um, he asked if I'd be general counsel. I became general counsel of that company. Um, 
and handled all the security dynamics of that. Um, it was a company that, that hit a billion dollar market cap or close to it, um, but also had the failings that many companies have <laughs> seen in the cannabis space. Um, CERN is now on stable footing and doing okay, but it was uh, a great lesson in uh, the investing world in cannabis, things like FINRA, things like the OTC market, things like toxic debt. Um, but I did quite well with CERNA. Um, I ended up become investing in several different projects, nutraceutical projects, but one of the primary investments I made post CERNA was Sensi Media Group, um, which I've helped kind of advise and, and drive. We appreciate that too, by the way, Tay. I really, really appreciate that thing. <laughs> good, good. Let's keep building it. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm currently uh, partnered with a group uh, that's placing capital and in different investments in the space right now from hemp to, um, to cannabis plays to, uh, things that aren't associated to cannabis, but we think we'll get there. Um, you know, I tend to think psilocybin is a, one of the next big ones as far as research is concerned. So I, it, I, it was more by default that I became involved in this realm of, of the investing dynamic in cannabis. Um, but it's a, it's a fun market right now, lots of challenges and also robust opportunity. Now, when you, when you say you came into the, you know, you kind of came by chance through the element of law, uh, you know, you're involved in the NFL agency. Why cannabis? I mean, I know that there's a civil rights play here and everything, but, you know, you're kind of on this track. You had some success going down this path that you did. And, and here you even had this law degree, a very celebrated attorney, but I see you making so many interesting moves in the investment world. Why, why the change? Why not just practicing law and being the best? You know, first of all, being a lawyer sucks. So that's the primary <laughs> reason. No. I don't mind it as much as some other lawyers do. For me, I think it's an opportunity position right now. You know, we were approached by many different brilliant people with many different brilliant ideas. I think one of the biggest challenges in this industry is and has been capitalization. Um, you know, I, th I think to execute properly in this industry, you need more capital than most people anticipate. Um, and I've witnessed uh, many great ideas fail as a result of not being funded in, in the proper way and, and with, the, with intelligent money. Um, so, you, you know, I, I enjoy that dynamic of connecting the right people and the right minds to the right creators, to the right uh, management and infrastructure teams to make things happen. Well, that brings me, you know, Gene, uh, I know at Arc, you, you guys have done so many I would say unique approaches towards investing and getting eyes on brands through the years. And, you know, Gene, tell me a little bit about yourself and the role that you play day to day. And then a little bit of what makes ArcView different. A lot of people think is ArcView, is this a fund? Is this a group of investors? You have a unique model there. Tell us a little bit about that. I like the fun part and that it is. Uh, I, uh, I am so proud to, have, to be part of that team. Uh, founded 10 years ago, people don't know that, by two of the greatest pioneers, Steve D'Angelo, who is just a, a wonderful man and uh, so uh, caring about this industry and its long history uh, that the war on drugs created. And Troy Dayton, who is in his young 40s, but has been in the business 20 years. And they founded ArcView because they saw all the social justice issues, but they were the first to really understand that investors would want to convene, share ideas, share investments, share, uh, you know, co-investing, bring resources to each other. And so we're proud that actually we've educated and opened the door for so many business owners, entrepreneurs, and investors. And that's what's happened over the last many years. So over the last, uh, couple of years, we said, okay, our, there's more and more investors. Let's build some investment platforms for them. And so we are proud that we open doors for investors with great best of breed companies and in a number of ways. So I'm running a fund with a really a great guy, Jeff Finkel, and he and I uh, have created a hybrid. It's an angel net it's an angel network, but it's also a classic fund. So the members are involved in the decision making and they have a voice and for the whole reason that people want to learn. So if you jump into the due diligence and you're deep into the business model, hey, that's a great way to learn. And we lead that uh, diligence. So that's how that works. But we now have developed many tiers 
where investors can find a way in. We're doing, we're going to relaunch doing SPVs, which are a great way to go, especially if the minimum is 200 or 250,000 in a company. We're aggregating investors. What's and an SPV? Have, uh, sorry to interrupt, Jean, but what is an SPV? It's a special people? purpose vehicle okay. that stands alone, let's say as an LLC. And we create that doing all the heavy lifting on that, but it allows our members and investors to invest if let's say a great company has a minimum that's 100, 200, 500,000, and they wanna invest with 50,000. So there's one example. And then another is we have uh, uh, put together Arcview Capital, which is a broker dealer, FINRA approved. And so we're off to that with some new innovative ways, again, for investors to uh, invest as well as business owners to be uh, to be funded. So that's pretty interesting. So I love connecting people. Like Tay said, I love bringing resources to the table, investing in companies and seeing companies. I'm a real deal junkie. And so it's great fun to do that. And then the fun of spreading the word all over the globe, really on freeing the plant, what that's all about. So that's that's been really a great run for me. You know, I, I often hear from many brands in the industry, they're like, hey, you know, I, I was at a, an ArcView event or I was at some sort of panel or something. Do you, do you guys host events where, where these, these new businesses come and present in front? Uh, how does so, that work? This has been great. Uh, certainly a two-way street for me because I've been part of the team now for several years. So February, Santa Monica was our only and it was our kickoff event in 2020 and that's the last of the in person because every year we've put on at least five or six these are multi-day uh, two and a half day big events where investors come in and convene they're great fun we love being together being with each other so we have a fabulous uh, uh new ceo kim kovacs and she has helped great. us morph e immediately starting in march from a strong in-person presence to a really great digital presence. So every week we are putting on interesting information, bringing business owners to the table, showcasing companies, and that's been pretty exciting. I really like that. You know, and, and ArcView having such a unique model, and, and a lot of people would say, you know, is there a traditional model? Well, first of all, I don't think there's anyone on the call here that just follows traditional standards. Brings me to Matt and Entourage Effect Capital. I know you guys have two funds right now. I think you're in the process of making a third fund, Matt. Do me a favor. Tell me a little bit about, you know, your background and specifically what makes Entourage Effect Capital slightly different than, than ArcView, just uh, as a comparison. Sure. Um, and first of all, thanks for having us. And um, thank you for all you folks listening out there and watching for attending. Um, so a little bit about me. I mean, I've been in private equity for 25 years in a variety of different capacities. I've been with an institutional fund. I've been with a family office. I've been, I've raised several funds on my own for uh, varying strategies um, I got into the cannabis space in 14 through a roundabout way of doing some private lending on warehouses in Denver with owners looking to refinance their mortgages to get out of commercial debt into private debt so they could then lease to growers. Um, the luck and timing moment I had was when I realized that the, um, those yields that they were, they were paying, which were very high, would dry up and the, and the lending would become a commodity. But I just knew in the back of my mind that there'd be a dearth of capital out there for investing in the actual operating companies of cannabis uh, themselves. And so that's what I did. I started raising money for, um, to make investments uh, in the industry. And like you said, fast forward to now after, I mean, between now and then we've made 66 investments across multiple funds. And I'll use the phrase special purpose vehicles again and uh, we've said a lot of those but then yes you're right we are raising our our third fund the difference between us and, and art view is in fact art view is actually one of our holdings and we treat art view as our um when we see seed or very early stage investments we refer them to art view and hopefully they'll do the underwrite and make the investment um if it if it's if it's warranted but we invest in later stage deals uh, larger checks, uh, scale building opportunities with, across all the verticals within the industry. 
That's interesting. You know, and, and you have multiple funds. How does this work? Why not just one big fund? I mean, do you set up funds for different purposes? Walk me through that. Sure. So with private equity, it's, it's unlike a public company hedge fund. Uh, there's no redemption rights. So you sign up, you make, you make a commitment to a fund, the fund manager, then in our case, we do all the, it's, it's, it's a discretionary fund, meaning we're the ones that make the decisions on this. But that's what we're selling to our investors that we've been doing this since 14. We're the most prolific investor uh, in the industry in terms of number of investments made. And so if anybody knows how to do it, we sure as hell better. And so, uh, because it's hard. I mean, we tell investors all the time that to do this yourself is playing with fire because let's face it, there's a lot of bad actors out there. There's, I like to use the phrase, there's bodies buried in this industry that no one knows about. Well, the three of us on this panel know exactly what, who those bad actors are and where the bodies are buried and we avoid those. Um, anyway, so, but the way it works in private equity is you make a commitment, you, the firm, the, the fund starts making investments and then you have a period of time where you have to stop raising money because then it gets to the point to where uh, some of these companies could have different values at that point than they did when you came in initially. Whereas if you were a public company hedge fund, you could then say, okay, you know what, I'm, I'm, I've, feel like I've, I'm, I've rode the wave up. I'm, I'm ready to cash out. So you, you, you redeem your capital at that point. Well, we don't, you know, obviously in public, in private equity, this is illiquid investments. So we're, we don't have that luxury. So it's a long-term hold strategy. So, so with that play, and I find it interesting, you know, Gene, he mentioned the idea that when some of these startups come, um, you know, they direct them towards you all at Arcview. Uh, is, is that where you are built? You're built to, to work with the smaller investments? Is that your sweet spot, Jan? I mean, what is the difference? There? Yes, the, the fund that I'm managing, uh, we're looking for early stage companies and uh, catching them. And that's been a great partnership with Entourage Effect Capital to work together like that. And then the whole idea is to do upstream. So as these companies scale, tell them about it knock on their door and say, look what we've got, look what we grew, meaning company scaling. So that's a pretty exciting partnership, but we have now an array of ways to invest even for larger companies, and that's pretty exciting. So that's what we're doing now is serving the investor base, the business owner and entrepreneur at many levels. That's amazing. Tay, you know, as, a, as an attorney, and, and obviously you have your, your foot in the industry for, for many years, what do you see that's different about cannabis investing, or even being a brand in cannabis, I'm seeking investors. Why is it not just so cut and dry like it would be if I was starting any other brick and mortar business? Well, I, th I think it's been the same story now for 10 plus years as you still have federal prohibition. Um, and until that changes, I think you're always going to have that first block to what I would call traditional uh, institutional capital. Banking obviously is a serious issue as well. Um, it's not that companies can't be banked, but there are challenges associated to and around banking. Um, so when you're going out to a traditional investing world, uh, this is a high risk portfolio item for many of them. Now, do I think it's high risk in the regard that they think it's high risk? No. Um, do I think it's high risk in the sense that some of these businesses may fail? Yes. Uh, but I, I think when you look at this industry, we've, we've been facing this fear factor dynamic um, for a long time. For a long time. I think that's shifting. I think it's shifting pretty drastically now. Um, you know, when, when you see these NASDAQ SPACs coming in with $200 million and, and acquiring major chains in Colorado and other places, um, it, it kind of puts the writing on the wall. So I, I think that we're, we're kind of in that mid-course position right now where you're seeing a shift, um, not only in the, in the dynamics of uh, who the investor is, but also uh, the access to capital that they had prior to, to where we sit today. So if I'm a startup brand, you know, I come across you, uh, whether it be as an attorney or any of the other roles you play in the industry, and you sit down, we have a conversation. What is that bit of advice, Tay, that you would give to me before I go meet Gene, or if I have even a broader idea before I sit down with Matt, from your perspective, what do you think is a good takeaway for them? Well, I, I it, have your have your strategy in place and have it refined and and have a real plan you know i think that there's a a, a brilliant a brilliant product is not a brilliant business right um so i w what you see many times is is 
creatives dictating the direction of a business. Um, and that's where I see a lot of the failures occur. Really? Um, as creators, the- not, not necessarily the greatest business mind. Um, so it, it really is make sure that your team is strong enough to understand the traditional dynamics of business, um, that understand the traditional dynamics of investing and convertible notes and, you know, basic dynamics that a, that a lot of people don't quite understand when they get into the process. So organization and strategy to me are, are key point number one. I think that's amazing advice. You know, Matt, I, I, I think looking at this, when larger brands come to a brand like yours, it's got to be intimidating. I was recently on a panel and, and somebody had mentioned, I thought this was somewhat prolific, that, that there are three main things that you need to address if you want to get somebody's attention. You need to look at a problem and, and you have the solution to solving that problem. Uh, you need to present the team, the team that can execute upon solving that problem. And you need to show that your brand has traction. And without those three things together, it's kind of dead in the water when it comes down to investment. Do you think that that's true, Matt? What are you looking for as something that really catches your eye worth another meeting with the brand? Sure. Well, recognize we don't just invest in brands, but we'll use this as an example. Um, I think you're spot on. Uh, first and foremost, it's the people. And that, that's across any investment opportunity. It's, it's just how talented and successful the management team is that's, that's presenting the opportunity. Um, we typically don't back people that haven't had success previously. Um, you know, we, we are, we go through an exhaustive process of underwriting the individuals that are involved in the ownership and the day-to-day operations of the business. Um, and that's again, across any vertical, uh, but for a brand, um, then the other two are correct in particular, what kind of traction do they have and what's the size of the market? Um, you know, two of our larger, uh, brand investments are in California and that's by design. It's just, it's the largest market. And, and they have, they had traction and continue to build traction. And that's a, and you know, when you have a, a an industry that's set up on a state by state basis, um, you better have a plan of attack within that state with your end that you're in. And if it's not big enough to be, um, you know, the, the bull in the China shop in that, in that state, then you better go somewhere else too and be successful. So that's kind of the way we look at brands. You had mentioned the idea of it's not just brands. What else is there that you invest in? I, I know ArcView is a, f- a fund. Uh, I, what is the other instruments? Well, outside? I mean, ArcView is not just a fund. ArcView has a whole bunch of other uh, tentacles that Gene can speak to. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, there's, there's uh, genetics. There's biosynthesis that Gene will talk about. There's multi-state operators. There's vertical integration between retailers and manufacturing and, and, and cultivation. Uh, you know, early on in 14 and 15, we made a lot of cultivation investment because that's, guess what? That's, that's where the starting point is. And that's where the industry was starting. Well, now the industry has, has, has moved and standalone cultivation isn't really, you know, what we do per se, because we've, we've moved up the value chain. Uh, we do the technology in the, in the, in the picks and shovels that, that keep the, the industry moving. So there's 15, 20 different sectors within the, uh, uh, the ecosystem of the, of the industry that, that we've either looked at or invested in. That's phenomenal. I mean, and, and he brought up bio, uh, biosynthesis and some of the new trendy things that are out there. I know, Gene, we were talking prior to this. You brought up something that you thought was just really cool and that you had a, a very good grasp a, as a fund on and you really are seeing through. I believe it was Calibre. It might have been the brand that you guys are focused on right now. Was it, was it the... Calibre. Calibre. I'm sorry about that. Is it, is it the technology? Is it the... What made that a, a cool thing for you guys to work with? Explain it's, me that. This whole area of biosynthesis, and there's also something called chemical synthesis, is fascinating. And <clears throat> what it is, is being able to produce a compound, a cannabinoid, in a lab. Now, just think about the steady state nature of that. Now, think ahead. Imagine you're head of a uh, giant uh, uh, beverage company. And are you going to, what are you going to use once you do make the corporate decision to go the CBD or even the infused THC route? Are you going to trust a variety of strains? Because back to the brands, if you drink a Stella in California, you want it to taste the same in New York. Mm -hmm. Is that going to happen? That's so hard to replicate. 
not impossible, but so hard. And various extraction technologies are getting us there to some stability. But the big, I believe, after studying this area of the uh, lab produced cannabinoids, and don't worry, you'll still be able to smoke your flower. And I certainly believe that, that the world of growing flower is here to stay. So I am not displacing it. However, I've now come to believe after studying this now for a few years and meeting with many companies in the space, that big food and big drink, big beverage world will want the stability of some of these lab produced cannabinoids. I also believe they could help produce some of the narrow cannabinoids beside the well-known ones. So that's just one area, uh, like Matt was naming. Uh, many people think it's just a license holder, a retail shop, or a grow, but it is varied and it's diverse. And that's the whole point. You need your PhD in cannabis in order to invest wisely. And we believe in professional management and professionally run funds to help guide those investments. It is, it is very complicated. And you brought up a great point. You know, when I'm, when I'm hearing things like biosynthesis, I'm sure a lot of people are like, is this GMO? Is this, what is this? But you brought up the idea of the economy of scale. And, and I thought that that was, was a pretty remarkable analogy there. When you're looking at the idea is, yeah, I would want my product to be the same no matter where I went in the country. And I would assume just like many agricultural project, uh, products, we probably just wouldn't even have enough space across the country to create a consistent strain pool to even supply the beverage industry. Is, is there been any pushback at all that this is uh, that this is a GMO thing or this isn't natural to do that or what have you seen? Yes sure that's right but check this one out. I was fascinated also does this fall under schedule one and technically it does not. We've investigated that Dave might want to weigh in on that but it's very interesting. There's a perception that it is so people are going to believe you know that they're uh, if they're drinking something that has THC in it that was produced in a lab. So there's a lot of issues around it, but there's also some technical workarounds. And believe me, uh, as I said, it's not gonna replace the growth of flower, but so many vitamins and other pharma drugs are created this way today. People don't realize that. Well, you know, Tay, she brought up the idea of the scheduling of drugs. And also, I know that, you know, both as an attorney and in the investment world and everything, you've worked with a lot of tribes, whether it be on, on hemp uh, and, and some of the things you've been involved with some amazing laws and, and writing policy. Looking at something like that, this whole world of the, the biosynthesized component, where do you see that fit into the, into the traditional industry? Uh, is it the future? Is it faux pas? What do you feel about this? I think it's just a, a different side of the industry. And I look at it more from the pharmaceutical um, and the product side, the, the mass product side. Um, it, like Gene said, I don't think you're going to replace flour. Um, you know, concentrates, it's going to be concentrate. But there's certainly this massive push now into the biomedical research and, and the food and beverage realm. And these other areas, you need 100% um, consistency of product. So, you know, I think you're just going to see more of a diversification of the industry rather than a, a plucking or, or taking from one side or the other. Uh, I, I certainly think the FDA and DEA will come after these, these uh, certain, uh, look at something like Delta 9 or Delta 8, right? You can infuse that and get just as high as you can on THC edible. So, um, are they technically illegal right now? No. Are they protected under the farm bill right now? Yes. Is that going to stay the same? No. So, I, you know, we have, uh, I'll have people approach me about this great Delta 9 gummy play that they have and how they're going to sell it in gas stations. And, you know, my advice is always run for the hills. It's, it's you know, you could be ahead of the curve and maybe strike lightning quickly, um, but eventually the lightning hits you. So, you know, I think you, you have to be sophisticated in your approach with that. But but what Gene's talking about is, is incredibly relevant for the future of where this industry is headed um, from the pharmaceutical side and that food and beverage side. I think that's amazing. Uh, I bring up good points. Gene, did you have a follow up on that? I'm yeah, sorry. Chris, uh, staying with you know, what's innovative and what's going on, uh, if you follow the money, which we all do on this uh, discussion today, the flow of funds are still going into the uh, retail and cultivation license holders. But take a look, what do they need? They need the infrastructure around them, 
I am a long time tech investor, many years. So I am going after a lot of tech platforms. I'm looking for these license holders need technology to operationalize themselves, to find efficiencies in the grow room, in uh, building a company, uh, in uh, reaching your customers. So there's all kinds of technology that is needed is the point. And big tech to date generally hasn't been playing. That's going yeah. to happen in time. And we can hardly wait for that. I am one who doesn't fear that because I live through the whole tech buildup and internet world. And I know that when the great big companies came along, it was easier to buy than build. So I right. see lots of acquisition ha happening over time as these best of breed tech platforms are built and bringing innovation and efficiency to the license holders. So I'm really excited about that. And that is one of the things that I see happening now in real time with something else very interesting that's important. What's happening is the non-cannabis investors, the traditional tech investors, private equity, and even believe it or not, CalPERS, a major investor have awakened and are starting to look around and invest where the action is. So really? that, that's a pretty exciting sea change. To, to Gene's point, if I can add to that, I think there's also, I think it's a big opportunity in the cannabis space on the brand side as well. And I've said this for over five years now, I think brands are incredibly undervalued. Um, you know, we're, we're, they're getting one for one valuations oftentimes on, on revenue. Um, some of them may be even uh, operating at a loss but the amount of market share that they have can be significant. And I think there are several, more than several out there uh, that are waiting for the precise opportunity Gene's talking about. When the yeah. big guys come, when the feds flip, that one for one is going to become a, t a 20 to one or a hundred to one because you don't want to build that brand again. You just right. want to acquire it. Right. I'm getting and questions in from the uh, audience right now. I'm just going to yeah. jump over. Uh, sure. uh, Matt, I'm going to put this one to you because there's, there's one for you as well, Gene, and this, well, there's some for all of you. You know, Matt, going into your third fund and having the success that you've had, and one thing that a lot of people need to, need to realize, it's somewhat easier to successfully enter into investment, and it's much harder to successfully exit from investment. So if you're looking at somebody that has the knowledge in the investment world, you want to ask them how many successful exits they've had, not how many investments they've made as one of the indicators to their success. You know, Matt, the question came in, how do you oversee compliance at all of your cannabis companies and investments to protect the funds from penalties and fines? It's, it's with the ever-changing landscape and some of the socially vexing movements out there. How do you protect that as an investment standpoint? Well, um, luckily, fun, and, and, and Tay can probably speak to this, you know, legally, but typically the way we operate is we are active minority investors in the deals we invest in. We usually don't control the companies that we, that we, where we, that we invest in, but we take board seats or we have other, you know, negative covenants and belts and suspenders to give us, you know, some semblance of control with expenses and costs, et cetera. Having said that, the, the, the regulatory aspect and the oversight really comes at the, at the underlying asset or company level. It doesn't come at our level. Um, you know, we're in some situations, you know, back in, back in the early days, you know, I had to get fingerprinted because I was investing in Colorado and lived there. You know, um, that's changed a lot over the years. The residency requirements have really laxed in most of the states. Um, so it really doesn't apply to us, especially, and that's one, one, one other good reason to be uh, diversified across multiple different investments through a fund vehicle like us versus doing, you know, the, the rifle approach yourself and, and, and maybe getting caught up in a situation like that where you are controlling uh, something that, that, you know, over your, on your watch, even though you're not involved on a day-to-day -day basis, something goes sideways and, and, and you could be at risk um, regulatorily. Do you, do you see the world for the cannabis investment change when it's federally legalized? What is there? Is it better? Oh, it's or gonna it be, well, I mean, it's going to change dramatically. I, mean, I think, look, Gene alluded to this earlier. That this is a, I mean, there's two things that are going on right now. I mean, one, one is that this isn't a creation of a market. It's a, it's a transformation of one. I mean, there is a 
uh, the illicit market is so big and so robust that no one ever knew the scope and magnitude of it until, you know, states like Colorado and Washington and Oregon became legalized. They realized they're going to have to uh, compete further with the tamping down of the illicit market. And California, quite frankly, has done a terrible job at it uh, because the taxes and, and regulatory uh, systems in place are, are, are nightmarish. Um, having said that, COVID has, has helped that. Uh, COVID is, you know, we hate to say it, but it's the truth. I mean, COVID has been a blessing in disguise for the industry with what, with the essential business designations and, and the conversion of the illicit market in States like California, people are tired of going and getting their stuff from the street corner at a safe, socially distanced, uh, curbside pickup dispensary. And we see, we have seen it firsthand with, with, with increased sales from new customers and then those customers become repeat customers. And so where are they coming from? Guess what? They're coming from the illicit market. So that's the one thing that's happening. The second thing that's happening is that we're in a race prior to legalization. And from an investment standpoint, you better start placing some bets because guess what? Once it becomes federally legal, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, everybody else is going to start investing in this and it's going to be too expensive to enter. So now's the time. Absolutely. So that's, that's our, I mean, that's the big part of our thesis is that we want to build scale right now and put companies together that, that are in our ecosystem or outside our ecosystem and, uh, and build the companies uh, up to where they will be more attractive uh, build versus buy targets, as Gene alluded to earlier. That's amazing. You know, you brought up COVID and, and, and Gene, I'll ask this question to you. Uh, Matt brought up COVID as is. As, as- it played a, a significant impact, you know, on the industry in general. I know for us at Sensi Magazine, you know, we've historically been such a game changer in the print publication world. And, you know, we sat back here and like, listen, you know, uh, during COVID, we paused our printing. We focused, tripled down on technology. And, and we know that technology is going to play a significant role in our future as a brand. You brought up tech as, as the time. And, and COVID has um, unleashed a lot of new tech apparatuses, new ways to communicate where do you find these tech companies? Is it, are you going out and looking in the tech space for them? Are they coming into the cannabis arena and pitching you? That's interesting. Where does that come from? Yes, uh, the answer is everywhere possible. Uh, voracious reader uh, uh, in the pre COVID days, uh, uh, you know, attended and was part of so many conferences and gatherings because it is a people thing. But I, being in the tech world as an investor, with the fund in New York City. I have played in that tech arena for many, many years. And so people know me from that world and say, take a look, would you look at this? Or what do you think? Or would you help get, uh, you know, this person started who just rolled off his or her, you know, interesting tech play. So that's what we're seeing. Business owners and entrepreneurs coming into the marketplace who played in traditional worlds. And now they have awakened and they're part of it. But also, our license holders know this too. Just the other night, we had Matt's uh, investment and uh, our friend Jessica Billingsley on, the CEO of Akerna. She said her platform, which is a seed to sale platform and uh, POS, has an API, which is that interface, to 80 other platforms. Wow. Yeah, those are financial platforms, many of them marketing platforms. So crossing that divide that's been there for so long. That's the point. And that's happening already. So you can just see what's going to happen over time. My favorite story is this. We were the only earliest stage investors as an institution in NetSuite way back in the day, one of the first cloud-based computing companies. And I went to that CEO six years ago and said, you could own the marketplace because they have have a well-doing ERP platform. He said, lawyers won't let us. Cite, look what, look what your world has done. <laughs> Never trust a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, and, and so look at that. And then uh, these other platforms, such as Akerna, uh, figured it out and went to market. Uh, and so the big tech didn't play and still are not for the most part. But just you wait, they are coming and they are playing. Uh, and uh, and that's going to be, I, I believe, good, again, as I said earlier, for the best of breed platforms. 
And it's pretty exciting, some of the ones that are building quarter over quarter growth. It's very exciting to see that, to be part of that. And I have this disease of FOMO. And so when I miss one, I am just so upset because I've been watching this now, this marketplace and playing in it now since 2014 and seeing it build brick by brick. It's pretty exciting to play in the sandbox. It really is. Go ahead. You mentioning Jessica speaks perfectly too to patience and drive. You know, yeah. I, I, I joke that Jessica's a very good friend of mine. I have a business card from Jessica from a trade show, I think in 2010 or nine when they first <laughs> entered the market and it's perforated <laughs> on the sides. <laughs> I was going through cards a, a couple of years ago and found this thing. And you know, that this is an example of people that, of, of, of a, a woman that saw an opportunity, she and her partner, Amy at the time, and just kept driving. Um, and this industry is very much still in that space. There's this need to keep driving and to keep going forward. And there's going to be humps and there's going to be hurdles. Um, but as, as Matt says right now, now's the time to start placing your bets because we aren't far away from, from the big guys coming in. Right. And often many people even say, if I missed it, is it too late? There's no way it's too late. <laughs> it's still early days, but now is the sweet spot of investing. And, it, and because we are on a march toward this sector being a hundred billion dollar industry. That's really, remarkable. Over just the next few years. And it's so, so it's pretty, pretty interesting. And a global marketplace, as you know. You know, Matt, the, they, they bring up the idea of, of the, now is the time you brought it up. I see the hemp industry. Like in the last year, it's like everybody, every cousin I have has got a CBD company. Everyone in my hometown has it. There's multi-level marketing CBD companies, all of this. And then there are hemp brands and all this. Where does hemp fit into all this? Is it, is it, is it a good investment? Is it on your radar? I see you have some great brands you're investing, but what's the difference there in the hemp arena? Well, um, and that's a very good question because it, there's a huge difference. Uh, Tay alluded to this earlier about, uh, I mentioned the farm bill and just to, for people that aren't familiar with the difference between THC and CBD, uh, I mean, THC is the psychoactive and CBD is just another, it's another uh, cannabinoid within the plant and the two of them come together to create some of the medicinal benefits along with other, um, uh, with other parts of the plant as well. But the the hemp-based CBD products are now, because it's been federally legalized through the Farm Bill, um, when it then becomes legalized by that state where it's grown or sold uh, and or sold, then um, you're now under FDA purview. Mm. And when that happens, you better watch out about what kind of claims you're be being made, because if you make claims that aren't true and can't be proven, your product could, could get yanked off the shelves. And the FDA to this point has not been terribly clear about what they're going to allow and not allow. <laughs> it's been difficult. So right? that, that's too big of a risk for us to take at this point. All, all the brands that we have invested in with the exception of one um, have THC components to it. Um, we have Sublime, which is the number one pre-rolled brand in California. Wow. We have Sunderstorm, which is the number one, number two uh, gummy uh, provider in, um, in the state of California. Uh, we've got uh, canned beverage, which is uh, THC and uh, CBD uh, soda water. Uh, we've got, um, but then we also have a company called Hayoma, which is CBD only, but it's a high-end uh, lotion product that is that, that doesn't make claims. And so if, if we see something that, um, that we like, the first thing we look at is, are they making claims? So uh, these are just two of the pitfalls that, that investors need to be careful about. And, and, and we obviously spend an enormous amount of time uh, familiarizing ourselves with the ever-changing regulatory landscape across the nation. Now, when, when, when you say, so you mentioned earlier, you know, the shovels and the pit companies and all that, the ancillary, ancillary providers, the equipment manufacturers, is that, is that a safe investment in the hemp world? You know, I had hemp licenses and I can tell you, like, if let's say you get in in maybe February and you decide you want to flip your farm over and you wanted to get a piece of equipment to help you even put the seeds in the field or harvest your crop. When I first got into it, there was about an 18 to 24 month wait, even if you had all the cash in the world right then and there, because there was no funding. 
at all in this kind of arena for large scale hemp operations. Is that stuff that's on your radar at all as a brand that, that deals with big? And why is that? Is it just well, n- n- not not right now. I mean, right okay. because there's a there's a supply glut of hemp for CBD based products, right. and it's because everybody rushed into the into the market to start you know hemp becoming their their new cash crop versus whatever they were growing before and. And I mean, anybody that took a step back could see it coming. And then you have people being unsure about where the FDA is going to start, you know, coming down on things. And all of a sudden there's not enough product being made and there's product on the sidelines. I mean, the truth of the matter is that uh, there's been a supply glut off and on with uh, just THC based marijuana. Uh, and, and that, that happens just, it, it's part of the supply and demand uh, issue that, 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 you know, that, that any industry deals with. So, uh, I would be very, very careful and cautious about investing in the equipment on the hemp side of the business because it's, it's still, there's still a lot to be, uh, determined on, on how that all shakes out. You know, that, that, that's an amazing point. Go ahead, Tay. I'm just saying it's important to look at who's out there too. When you're talking about an agricultural industry, mm-hmm. um, no doubt many different manufacturers making many different products that they've yet to modify to suit the hemp plant. So when you, when you look at something like the industrials or the manufacturing side of hemp, it's just such a high risk, high, high risk move. Like John Deere one day can just say, Hey, listen, right. if you want to go down and now we've got to lock on all the equipment more or less. That's right. 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 That's, that's, right. That's, a, that's a very good, very good point. You know, um, to that same point, you know, Looking at the timeline, you know, hemp, it, it took, I mean, generations from when it was once legal to become legal again. Uh, Tate, what do you think the timeline is for THC and all of that? And do you think that's going to play a role at all in the hemp world? And, and everybody rushing to it right now, we, we do have this extra stock of hemp in the nation. Um, what do you think that federal legalization, the timeline for it is, and how is it going to play a role into this newly legal hemp industry? You know, I've been, I've been getting asked that same question for 12 years now and <laughs> this time i'm here you know the the rumors from our lobbyists this time were that was that were that trump was going to run on a federal medical marijuana ticket on some level or another um, now you have biden and kamala harrison on the democratic side that doesn't give me much faith that we're going to see any action if a democrat gets in um and i'm really? not politically taking a side here but i just yeah. think that Joe Biden has a history of being anti-drug and anti-cannabis and anti-everything. So um, it's not a guaranteed thing here coming from the, the, you know, regardless whoever's in office. I think a lot of people assume that historically you get a Democrat in office. Now, now times to do it. But it's really looking at policy history in the past that we need to look at as to what dictates hold, the future. Hold on. Hold your horses, everyone. I, now, yeah, right. hey, you got to remember that Kamala is also the Senate sponsor of the Moore Act. And this my, is true. And my very representative here in the Upper West Side of New York City is Jerry Nadler, who is the sponsor in the House. And so I really believe the Moore Act will be put in place. I believe that Kamala Amazing. will beat Joe over the head and say, get with it. That's my hope. <laughs> That's and awesome. thirdly, I totally believe a blue Senate changes everything. Really? Because now we have smart people on the Democratic side calling the audibles in the Senate. So I am working hard to make sure that happens in every state where we have a chance, because then the Senate will wake up, will pass the Safe Banking Act, of yeah. which, as you all know, the current chairman in Idaho, uh, I-, I pronounce his last name Crapo, it's actually <laughs> Crapo, is standing in the way of even this being discussed. So okay, have- Gene, let's not get too political here. Here's, here, here's <laughs> not- the bottom line. Why Here's not? You know why? Because that's going to change everything. I, I, that, that, I, I'm not, and I'm not arguing one way or the other, but I think, but let's do take it back to take politics out of this. And I, and well, the reason let, why I'm saying that, hang on a second. Let me, let me say right. something. The reason why I say that is it's actually very logical. Um, the it, it's, there's over 65% of Americans uh, want legalization. So mm-hmm. that's number one. Number two we have just got, we're, we're still going through something we've never been through before where trillions of dollars have been spent on something we're still trying to figure out in this pandemic. Mm-hmm. And as a result, every single layer of government, be it municipal, state, or federal government, it needs new revenue streams. Right. And both Democrats and Republicans can appreciate right Republicans 
will start to realize that, wait a minute, there really is this thing called an illicit market in cannabis. Why can't we get benefits from that? Why aren't we taxing and regulating that? And so if I, if my personal opinion is the marijuana lobby was smarter and, and told more uh, logical arguments like that to the far right, then those are the people that whose minds would more likely change because they're holding, they're grasping onto straws with this, uh, with the social and moral aspect of this, that's being tamped down by the day, by the number of people that are, that are approving it. I think, and so my, my personal belief is that whether there's a Republican or Democrat, uh, in, 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 uh, in office, but also across, uh, the Congress that, um, the time's going to come and there may not be a whole lot of difference on whether it's Republican or Democrat that's running that, that uh, point well, on that. I and I want to give the caveat, I'm not pro-Trump or Biden or Harris. Nor am I. Oh, I, 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 know, I don't think anyone's pro- side on any of this. But <laughs> totally it, from, a, from a timeline perspective, I think what Matt said is very true. I think when you look at just the, the social dynamic of, of America right now, over 50% of Republicans even support uh, the right. legalization of marijuana. So when you have that, and what I think we're going to see, which is a blue Senate and a blue House, you've got a shot. Um, we could have this happen in the next and, four years. And don't forget job creation, Huge. wealth creation, wellness creation. Yep. And, uh, and with the physician involved, it's pulling in the 80% of people blessing it in a bipartisan way. So that's sure. pretty exciting. Uh, yeah. And also tax revenue, isn't that a good thing? That's Look a massive thing. Colorado. Colorado. You know, well, that's, that's, that, that's, my, that's my point precisely. And I think yeah. to, to further to, uh, you know, the need for revenue, the, the, uh, the, the public opinion, um, the fact that it's becoming one of the more bipartisan, well, maybe the only bipartisan issue out there right now, <laughs> yeah. um, where there's not just a straight party right you know, line uh, split on, on for or against. So I, I don't worry about it. In fact, the reality is, is that, like I said earlier, that I don't want it to happen tomorrow, but I certainly would like it to happen within the next four to five years, just because that's the, I mean, selfishly and for my, I'm a fiduciary to my investors and that's within the timeline of, uh, of the returns we're seeking. And there's no doubt that upon legalization, uh, most of these companies, if not all, their valuations will increase. Right. I think that's a very good point. You know, one thing that was brought up is the kind of social dynamics that are involved in this. And, you know, I come from partisan politics in the past, and then I ventured into the world of, of impact investing, social entrepreneurship. And what I found to be wildly interesting in the cannabis space is like here in Nevada, we passed the law. The whole point was for the tax revenue to go towards our school. Uh, school system in Nevada, we actually have one of the lowest ranking schools uh, uh, systems in the entire country. And ultimately, the money ended up in a rainy day fund off to the side. Now, <laughs> of course, are good at that. Yeah, right now, of course, the school has access to the rainy day fund, but so does all other government programs. And what I find even more interesting is that if, if I'm a cannabis brand and I want to make a donation to a charity or kind of close some of these, these gaps, I oftentimes face a roadblock with some 501c3s being in, in, in kind of a fear situation of if, if I receive this money, is it going to put in jeopardy uh, anything I have going on uh, with my federal IRS uh, signification of the 513c? Uh, you know, on that, you know, ArcView, I know you guys are tremendously involved in social impact and, and you guys really look at brands that, that matter. Uh, but from that, how much does that play a role? in some of these new brands, Gene, like, you know, does socially conscious brands or brands that are focused on social enterprise, did they take a, a higher seat at all when you're, when you're talking to them as an investor? I, I think they take an important seat in today's world because we who are investing and playing in this incredible sector uh, understand clearly that the war on drugs had this big negative impact on people of color, people who've been harmed by the drug war, and that we know clearly that the war, war on drugs is a war on science and research and people. And so that makes us ever more uh, joined together in the common mission, not only to free the plant, but to let's unleash that illicit market, take some of those incredible talented people and get them into the legal license market. That's important to us because we also know we're standing on the shoulders of those who have really built this marketplace, fought for it, got arrested for it. So we yeah. have that awareness 
And so, yeah, the door is open to those who have the hustle power and brain power and interest to either get a license or build a tech platform or whatever, and are conscious of having those doors open, inviting people to the table. Uh, women, uh, an open door for them. It's always been hard for women to finance their companies, people of color and uh, people who have been impacted. So yes, there's a higher state of awareness to be uh, aware and invitational to those people, help them, mentor them. We're creating programs like that, that, that does uh, support uh, uh, you know this this uh, this need. I, I think that's phenomenal. I mean, we're getting close here to the end. We got about five minutes left. I want to ask this question, you know, to all of you. What, Jean? I'll start with you. What do you feel is that gap? I'm a new person. I'm an entrepreneur. I've just got my whatever qualifies me as such. I want to get involved in the cannabis space. What type of business do I get involved with? Let's assume I know that really well. Whatever it is. Sure, sure. So I. Uh, have delivered a discussion, I'll call it, for many years to both tech audiences as well as now cannabis world. And I call it the five stupid things that uh, entrepreneurs do all the time. I also say the five stupid things that uh, investors do. But to your point, uh, I've looked across the companies we've invested in already, and many of these dynamic business owners and entrepreneurs uh, have leveraged their background Maybe it wasn't the same, but it was an allied world where they were operationally savvy. Maybe they understood supply chain and logistics. Uh, uh, just the interest in the, in the plant, let's say. And they're able to leverage that into a, a, a cannabis company by either joining forces with other people or whatever. But back to these, uh, a few of these five things that they gotta understand. I believe one of the biggest issues is the ability to package what you're doing. And I say, spit it out your mouth. So many, especially newbies, aren't used to how to package and uh, promote, let's say, what they're building or even explain it. Really? And then another big problem, and we talked about this earlier, the savvy around the financial part. Do they understand the numbers, what it takes to build? Because a second very big failing is the inability to even raise the right amount of money. And then close behind it is asking for absurd and silly valuation <laughs> because they don't know what they're doing. So there's so many entrepreneurs and practice and seasoned investors now. Uh, I just suggest to people who want to play, go find those people, work with them, put them on your team. And if you've got the fire in your belly, build that company, but be ready to bring in somebody who can help you scale it too. So uh, issues around the numbers, issues around packaging, and then which door to knock on. Because uh, I want to see a certain type of company at a certain stage. Matt has a different type of segment and focus and stage. Understand who you're pitching. So I think understanding that is critical. And the one liner that sums it all, does this entrepreneur, entrepreneur know what to do and how to do it? And so those are the types of people that we're looking for. That's phenomenal, Gene. If people want to get in touch with you directly, uh, you know, get in front of you, what is the best course of action for them to do I that? I welcome that. I'm, I'm crazy to say this, but I'm happy to field and I answer every email that I she get. Does. I put my I put my avatar on this platform, so go look me up. My email's there. I welcome people to write to me and find me. Happy Thank to do you. that. Or join with me, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, Thank you so much. I love to connect and I'm happy to help. You're phenomenal, Gene. Matt, same question to you. You know, uh, you deal with a different realm of investors. You know, I'm an institutional investor traditionally. I want to put my money behind some sector. I want to start a business in some sector. What is the gap that you see in the greater cannabis space that you think is a wise move for people to look at? So, well, let, let's let, let's talk about it a little bit differently. But Gene Certainly. did a good job of answering the the question about the 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 uh, you know what what type of what she's looking for in an entrepreneur. Why don't I talk a little bit about why I think it's important for investors to use a, uh, a fund or a fund manager versus doing it themselves. Um, we alluded to this earlier about how the cannabis industry is still a little bit of the wild, wild west. I mean, there, if you think about it, um, this is a arguably a $50 billion industry that, that is, that is not only top heavy, but it has zero uh, abil ability to get traditional debt. 
Uh, it's all supported by high net worth individuals or family offices from a capital deployment standpoint. There's no institutional capital um, that's providing the, uh, uh, the growth engine for, uh, for the capital. Um, and so there's several groups like us that have aggregated capital and made multiple investments and, uh, and, and the industry relies upon us. And I take it very personally and I take it very seriously to, to be successful at raising the capital to put where we, to put it to use where we think it's you know best served. If a lot of times we see people we don't know in the capitalization tables of companies that we end up passing on because they're not good, they're not good companies and they're not good people. And they've gotten to this point because they con somebody. And I think if, if investors that are not familiar with the industry would uh, partner more with groups like us, we would avoid that. Because like I said earlier, we know where all the bad actors are. I think that's um, brilliant advice. Yeah. Brilliant and then advice. I didn't, I'm not smart enough to put an avatar anywhere. So if anybody wants to contact <laughs> me, they could. It took me about an hour and a half to figure out yesterday. So yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm still, I'm, I'm stuck in the old times, but I'll say it now. My email address is mhawkins at eecpartners.com. That's, E is an Edgar, E is an Ecker, C is in capital. Really, really appreciate, Matt, your time and, and your impact in the industry is, is second to none. Uh, we're going to finish off with you, Tay. You know, I, you know, I've known you for a while now. I, I think you're, you got phenomenal insight in the industry, but your finger's always on the pulse of like the cool things. Even in our brand, we are just now doing some things you suggested five years ago. So what it boils down to it, what do you see, you know, um, as a brand, that last bit of advice you can give them before they meet, both of these two wonderful people or before they meet you in your investment funds? Well, I, I, that's a, that's a pretty broad question. I wish I had an answer to, but I can say this, you know, if you, what I tell everybody is if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're probably not. <laughs> um, and I, and, and I say that as, as kind of the metaphoric comparison to, to where we sit in this industry right now. I, I hear often that it's too late. Someone has done that already. Um, really? it, this industry is still a nascent industry. Um, people have done things, but have they done it better than you can is the real question. So uh, I think the first and most important thing is, is like Gene was saying, is focus on what you're good at first. Um, underneath that, surround yourself with brilliant people. You know, the, the, you maximize yourself by maximizing yourself with, uh, with the people you surround yourself with. And, and the companies that I've seen succeed are succeed because they're surrounded by talent. Um, you know, when I, I, I tend to see dictatorships fail, <laughs> um, but when I see these companies that work together and tap into the collective genius, you see success. Um, it, going back to what I said earlier, though, I, I still think there's an incredible opportunity in the brand realm of cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not just saying that, it, with particular emphasis on an infused product brand or a, a leaf brand. It can be a POS brand. It can be whatever you're playing in, in the tech side. And that's a point of sale um, brand, right, Tay, just for clarification. Right? Yeah, it okay. can be, you name it. Um, where the industry is heading, though, I, I think that we're going to see major opportunities open up on the distribution side of things. Um, you know, you have to look at cannabis right now, like, Something like liquor, um, you're going to see mega distributors that, that show up and that are consolidating brands. And, and right now I see a lot of these house of brand plays that, that very much plug into that distribution S dynamic. So, you know, I, I track it like I would track any industry, but if you parallel what the liquor industry has done to what cannabis is doing right now, um, you can see a lot of holes in the future. And I'm just using this as one example, but distribution is one of those one of those areas. You know, are you grabbing exclusive rights to a brand in California for New York in five years? Would it cost you five hundred thousand dollars to sit on that for five years? But when the feds flip, it's worth twenty million. Wow. You know, there, there's all these opportunities sitting out there right now that are very. And are hard you still to doing those five hundred thousand dollar loans to your friends, <laughs> Tay? If if That's we right. talk about it after, so if COVID fun. keeps going on, I'll need one. Um, <laughs> Hey, let me inspire with that thought, King, off of what Tay just said. I'm in New York City. The next big thing, make no mistake, is the East Coast wave as we are waking up, coming out of yeah. the dark ages. So 
that great brand that Colorado or California or Oregon has built, we want that on the East Coast. Love it. And today, because of the various fiefdoms, that's hard. You can't even ship a product. We're not as smart as Canada, who opened it up federally, so you can ship a product from uh, Vancouver to Nova Scotia. But in the US, you cannot ship that great product from California to New York. And so it has to be rebuilt under a license here. But there's no doubt that those savvy brands that can figure it out before legalization happens across the country, we want those and that is starting to happen in a very thrilling way. And that'll really help scale some of those great brands. I love that. But then yeah. once we wake up and do adult use up and down the East Coast, it's going to be a great thing because Colorado and California show us what the future is here in this wasteland <laughs> and, uh, of, of, you know, uh, the, it just so happens New York is the largest illicit market in the world. Wow. We, we long for these tested, beautiful products to be here. Oh, I long to uh, enjoy them there as well, Gene. Uh, Tay, how do people get a hold of you? Just so we, okay, we're going to end out here. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, email's best for me. You can email me at taydarnelllaw at gmail.com, or I've also got tay at hoban.law. You always leave it to Gmail, my friend. I love it. I think right. it's great. Yeah, uh, you know, I encourage everybody. Uh, we have such great questions come in from the audience today. I appreciate all of you, Matt, Gene, and Tay, for taking the time out today to discuss this interesting topic. For those of you that listened, Go meet him in the matrix inside of Emerge. There'll be uh, somewhat in there. Matt, we're still working on his character, but you know what? He's doing some influential things outside of there as well. So we're good to go. I'll be back uh, with you live at 2.30 Pacific time uh, for another great panel on disrupting the media in Auditorium A. So I encourage you all to be there. Um, and I thank you once again. This is Chris Foltz with Sensi Media Group. And we're just leaving it, leaving it now to you out in the Thanks, Emerge Chris. conference. Thank, thank you, guys. Gene, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, guys. That was terrific. Yeah, thank you all. I learned so much. Now, coming up at 115, Dismantling Systemic Racism, an action plan for the cannabis industry with Roz McCarthy. Don't miss it. Be there. See you then. With the experience Fritch has in pharmaceutical, food, and agricultural markets, we have instruments that were specially designed and engineered to reduce plant material and work with medicinal products. In the cannabis industry, we've taken that experience and we've been able to optimize an instrument specifically for the special attributes of the cannabis plant to be able to give the best success for elemental analysis in the laboratory testing or in processing prior to production. Hello, welcome to Intershim. We have solutions for THC remediation, pesticide remediation, and minor cannabinoid purification. Benchtop to industrial sized skids support this application. Solvent recovery systems are also available to complete the process. Intershim is a 50 year old company that's been supporting the pharmaceutical industry with various chromatography products.
Thanks for joining us today. My name is Steve D'Angelo, and some people call me the father of the legal cannabis industry. I'm here today to talk to you about a matter of urgent political and social importance. The Last Prisoner Project has one simple, single-minded purpose, to make sure that as a legal cannabis industry is built all over the world, our sisters and brothers still behind bars are not left behind to rot and in some cases to die in prison. The Last Prisoner Project is committed to achieving the release of every single cannabis prisoner on planet Earth. Our promise to you and to every cannabis prisoner is that we will not rest and we will not stop until we achieve that goal. Can you imagine sitting in a cell looking out on a world where people are legally building intergenerational wealth, doing exactly what it was that you were incarcerated for? Can you imagine being a prisoner in the time of coronavirus with no ability to social distance or even control who you're in close proximity to, where disinfectant and hand sanitizer is banned because of its alcohol content, where medical care at the best of times is difficult to access and of extremely low quality and even worse now during the crisis. It's a horrifying thought, isn't it? That's exactly the situation that more than 40,000 cannabis prisoners in the United States and hundreds of thousands more around the world are facing at this very moment. The Last Prisoner Project depends on donations from people whose lives have been positively impacted by the cannabis plant. If cannabis is a part of your life, we are relying on you for the resources we need to protect and defend our constituents, our sisters and brothers, some of whom are serving life sentences without parole for cannabis, quote, unquote, crimes. That means they will die in prison unless we get them out. They will die there just because they grew or sold some weed or fixed a vehicle that was used to smuggle cannabis. The good news is that we're making progress. In my almost 50 years of activism, I have never seen such a small organization build up such a big head of steam so quickly. Members of some of the most important cannabis families in the world, like the Tosh family and the Marley family, have endorsed our efforts. Creative artists from across the spectrum, Willie Nelson, Eric Rachmani, Revolution, Jim Belushi, Susan Sarandon, and many others have become ambassadors for The Last Prisoner Project. And some of the most important brands in the new legal cannabis industry have stepped up to the plate to fund programs like our Prison to Prosperity program that trains prisoners and makes sure they have a decent place to come home to and finds them jobs in the legal cannabis industry. The next program we hope to fund is our clemency program, which will encourage and help the governors of legal cannabis states to use their executive authority, authority they have now to release all of the cannabis prisoners who never should have been arrested in the first place, who were punished for something that never should have been made illegal. This isn't just a noble cause. This is something we can actually get done. If you'd like to help, if you'd like to make a small donation, if you'd like to make certain that our sisters and brothers have a chance to come home, have a chance to rebuild the lives that were stolen from them, if you believe that nobody deserves a life sentence for cannabis or now possibly a death sentence, please help us. What used to be a matter of simple restorative justice has now become an urgent matter of life and death. Any donation, however large or small, will make a big difference in the lives of thousands of prisoners. So please, seriously consider making one. Be well and stay free.